terembi, terembi, ni do ti wele. Terembi, terembi, ni do ti wele. Wo me tene, tembi, ni do ma be Congo, ni la moye. Nadungo, nadungo, tembe wali ni la moye. Nadungo, nadungo, tembe wali. Modo nango no titere, wangu no tembe kaya. Modo nango no titere. Tembe kaya, wangu no tembe kaya. Mono da be mo mo, Antoni mo, oh mbi. Mo da be mo mo, mbi na genta temo. Mono. Good evening and welcome. Uh, we are Laura Goldman and Elizabeth Shores, and we are very excited to have Alisa Trujillo and Faustin Linikula joining us tonight for an evening at Shanzamos. Before I introduce Elisa, who will be introducing Faustin, we would like to thank the art department of the University of New Mexico, as well as the Department of Art and Ecology and our private donors for making this ongoing, ongoing speaker series possible. Thank you so much. Throughout the talk, we will encourage you to submit written um, questions. And then after the talk, we would invite you um, to join the conversation live um, with camera and audio if you choose to do so, uh, which we found to be a lot nicer in terms of engaging with each other. Um, Alisa Trujillo is a student here at the University of New Mexico, majoring in contemporary dance with a minor in arts leadership and business. She began her dance journey in Gallup, New Mexico, with a community and crew dance program called Foundations of Freedom. She's currently a hip hop teacher at the Keshe Dance Center for the Arts in Albuquerque and a program associate associated with Flamenco Vivo Calotto Santana, um, which is based uh, in New York. As an artist, she seeks to create meaningful 
connections that inspire and empower people and communities to reach their fullest potential. She describes her journey with dance and the arts as constantly changing and unfolding process that can, um, as she says, appear messy. But it is in this unconventional evolution where she finds the inexplicable beauty and unbound love through and with her dance and art. Alisa Trujillo, thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for that introduction, Laura. Um, Faustin Linicula is a, a dancer, choreographer, director, and storyteller. He lives and works in his hometown, Kisangani, Democratic Republic of Congo, formerly known as Zaire. In 2001, Nicola founded Studios Kabako, which operates as a place of training, exploration, creation, and exchange for Congolese artists to share their stories through a vast array of art forms, including dance, music, theater, and film. In 2007, he was awarded the Principal Award for the Prince Claus Fund for Culture and Development, where Peter Sellers writes, Linicula's emerging body of work, compassion, irony, and unrelenting honesty challenged the bitterness of history. In 2014, he was awarded the first prize of the American Curry Stone Foundation for his role in cultural, informing cultural programs that encourage artistic expression and recognition of Kisangani's post-colonial instability, exploitation, war, and poverty. And it does not stop there. Lenny Kula is, is also the recipient of the 2018 Arts Fellowship for his film, Oz de Mont, and the 2019 Talberg Eliasson Global Leadership Prize. Faustin Lenny Kula's presence is raw and honest. His work is an accumulation of resilience, resistance, recognition, and revelation. Having the privilege to view his most recent work, My Body, My Archive, which premiered in March of 2020, and is currently online and available for viewing, I was able to witness Linicola's work firsthandedly. His audio autobiographical performance exemplifies the historical knowledge residing within one's living body. Typically, the story is not told in European history books. In this experience, I was intrigued by Linicola's openness and expression of Amer African fragility. The blows of the trumpet, duet merged with voice, and white painted bodies created a sense of nostalgia, yet introduced me to a narrative I did not know. The circle of artists created a space of support and understanding, reminding me of the value in community and interconnectedness of people and their lived and unlived histories. My body, my archive embodies the power of fragility using precarity as a source of creative and communal strength within the African body. As quoted in Linicula's My Body, My Archive, we are here and it is important to remember that we are alive and that is very beautiful. So thank you all for being here today and welcome to Houston Linicula. Hello, thank you, Elisa. Thank you very much. It's very late here in Kisangani, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. In fact, it's just past 3 a.m. Uh, or should I say it's very early. And this is the time of sorcerers and witches. And maybe this is what the world needs right now. Sorcerers and witches, magicians, people who can turn things around, miracles, to perform miracles like in Mozart Magic Flute, to have a new renewal, a renaissance of sort. I think this idea of performing magics to mend a broken circle is really one of the core elements in my work. Um, and we live in a world right now, which is quite broken. A world which is not for sure, a circle. Because when we dance over here, traditionally, before uh, every time we wanted to dance, we'd make a circle. And there is a whole symbolism to the circle, that idea of 
a community coming together. So we are side by side like brothers and sisters. Energy that goes from my right shoulder will come back uh, through um, the left one. And so there is solidarity. There is, you know, togetherness. But if I look at the world we live in today, for sure we can see that there is no circle or if at all it ever existed, it is a broken one. So the question for me is, what is it that I can do about it? This really is like a question of responsibility, the artist's responsibility, the artist's responsibility to propose a space of imagination, to propose a space for dreams. Because we need to dream big, we need to dream crazy to pull ourselves out of this complicated situation we found ourselves in today. And it, this is past COVID, it's the whole world in general. It's a chaos. And my whole country is an example of an ongoing chaos. And one thing that we're learning here is how to still find a possibility for making beauty in the middle of all that. So yes, my name is Fustan Linyekula. I'm known as a dancer and choreographer, but I like to talk of myself as a storyteller. For some years now, I've been saying that my dance is an attempt to remember my name. How can anyone forget their name? But when we look really seriously at it, we soon realize that the name, a name, any name is more complex than what we think. Because a name, although it is like a small identifying mark to identify an individual, actually a name, is larger than that because every name opens a web of relationships. Relationships to place, relationships to people, relationships to history. And when I look at the history that I'm most intimate with, the history of my country, my people, what I see is a lot of ruins, a lot of blood, a lot of tears. And so how can anyone remember their name in the middle of all that? How can anyone even say their name with confidence? I'm obsessed with history. And when you start, you're interested in history in this part of the world, you're confronted with the question of archives. What archives are available, actually? Before colonial times, that is before the mid 19th century, my people did not have the writing tradition. So they did not record and transmit their a tradition in the written form. Then came colonialism and it imposed the written archive as the only valid way of recording and transmitting history. And therefore, when you start studying our people, the kind of written history that you find just goes back 150, 200 years. This is too short to actually understand the history of a people it may be long at the scale of one human life, but when you look at the evolution of a people, it's too short. So if the only archives that I can find are 150 to 100 years old, and moreover, they are archives by the colonialist, archives from the winner's perspective, which with all the biases that uh, come with that, how then can I even access a certain kind of history? That's when I started looking at my dance as a possibility of exploring that. 
because every human body, even that of a baby who's just been born, every human body is ancient because genetically, I can connect this body to that of generations from many, 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 many centuries ago. So dancing becomes this moment when I ask my body questions. What do you remember? Hence my body, my archive, my body, my archives. What do you remember? I'm not even sure that if the body started to speak back, I would understand it. But let me ask the question anyway. And if the body can remember something, maybe that could be the deep meaning of my name in the middle of this broken reality, broken circles, the pile of ruins. So I'm, I'm left with a pile of ruins. That's what I inherited from my ancestors. But rather than just pointing fingers and saying so-and-so is responsible for these ruins and so-and-so did not do this, I ask myself the question, what is it that I can do about it? Can I take responsibility for fixing at my own little scale a bit of this? That's when I started really exploring the proscenium theater architecture, that frontal relationship. You're standing there, I'm here. I have an invisible fourth wall between us. It could sound paradoxical for an African to look at that as a possibility of searching for a circle, but let's look at it this way. Let's imagine a circle, more or less. And then let's imagine some mischievous demon coming with scissors and cutting. So the circle is broken and then they straighten these two lines face to face. Could this then be the proscenium theater? Dancer, spectator, spectator, dancer. So by looking at the proscenium theater as a possible broken theater, or rather a broken circle that had been cut into two and the two half circles have been made into straight lines facing each other. And therefore, when I go on stage, I take responsibility for giving us as a community gathering at this particular moment in this particular space, we give ourselves a possibility of recreating a circle, even if it's just for a minute or if we are lucky, for the entire time of a performance because there is a strong connection. This is how I view my work. My body, my archive, my dance as an attempt to remember my name, my dance as an act of responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the broken circle, the pile of ruins that I inherited from my ancestors but then taking them and asking myself, what is it that I can do about it? And so separating, not to stay away, but separating because I don't want to take the circle for a given. It's not a given. I want to take responsibility for that circle to emerge, but I'll negotiate it with 
my audience, because we all have to co-create this circle. No one, even the brightest leader in any society can be alone and make a circle alone. To make a community, you need to be many who accept to take that responsibility. And so going to the performance as a spectator or as a performer, as an act of responsibility towards this circle. What then are my strategies to give ourselves in this frontal relationship a possibility of a circle? I borrowed from cinema, because it's one of the most frontal art forms you can imagine. A camera, like now, is facing me. It frames me in a certain way. And in this frame, I negotiate the relationship between my body and the space around it. So if I lean back, my body kind of grows smaller than the space. And if I lean forward, the body becomes bigger than the space. That's the close up. Open and close. And so maybe as a dancer, by just placing my body somewhere on stage, either closer or farther away from the outside eye, I'm beginning to create a movement, not only on stage, but hopefully I can also get it to contaminate the audience where they start dancing with me even though they're sitting because I'm moving closer and I'm bringing my body really close. And when I bring the body close and I feel the frame, they see that they can feel my body directly. If I'm sweating, I can splash them. If I'm smelly, it will be there in their nose if I'm really that close. And then I can retreat and take my body really far, really far, really far. And then it becomes almost like just a floating image from far there. And by negotiating this back and forth movement with stops, I get closer, further, stop. By creating this movement in the spectator, I hope, I can just hope that it will get all of us into this state of dizziness and we'll make a circle. This circle might not last forever and maybe it should not last forever because then we'll start taking it for granted. Because it doesn't last forever. When we go back to our homes, with the memory of this beautiful moment, this moment of connectedness that we created, we can long even for more. And maybe we can take responsibility for making yet other circles happen. And in this work, the individual is really at the heart of it. Often my work is described as being political, but I think those who call my work political call it like that for the wrong reason. They stop at 
certain subject matters in show, you know, in certain performances and all that. But I think what is really political about my work is actually the central place that I give to the individual. Because I grew up in a dictatorship. And the very nature of a dictatorship is to negate the individual, to rob the individual of any sense of responsibility for their own lives. And therefore, we are just part of a herd. We have to follow the leader who is the only individual in any society, who thinks for everyone, who, who says what everyone should, should think, say, where even sometimes. So by putting my work back or taking my work back at the scale of, individu of the individual, it's a way of resisting the monolithic thinking system. It's a way of resisting the annihilation of the human being. But putting the individual at the heart of the work does not mean collapsing into a me, 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 me kind of um, space. No. No. I started by saying that my dance is an attempt to remember my name. And I said that if you're serious about a name, you can never collapse into yourself because every name opens a web of relationships. Relationships to place, relationship to people, relationship to history. And so when I place the individual at the heart of the work, the challenge is for this individual to remember their name and to see themselves as part of a web of relationships. How do they negotiate this? relationships and ultimately through these constant negotiations they can give themselves and the communities around them a possibility of recreating circles responsibility again and again so it is about putting the individual at the work, at the center of the work, but demanding of that individual a high sense of responsibility because they cannot afford the luxury of collapsing into themselves. Because they are reminded constantly of the fact that they are part of a wide web of relationships. And this obsession with the individual created a dream in me, a dream of making a work which is very people specific. And it's so people specific that when performers are not there, when a performer cannot be there, it becomes impossible to replace them. I don't know if I've succeeded yet, but that is the dream. To make work where every individual is so central to the shape of the work, the work to make work which is so specific to the people involved in the process that there is no way you can replace them when they're not there for one reason or another. Okay, there are pieces where I've replaced performers, but I, pro I approached it still with this idea that whoever left was a unique individual and whoever comes in is not coming to replace them. He or she is bringing their own individual history, their own individual sense of 
belonging into this place and we reshape the work with this new presence. So that's the closest I could get to the dream of making a highly people specific type of work. But this idea of responsibility, responsibility towards myself, but also towards the web of relationships that I'm part of, led me to look at the society at large beyond the dance or theater space, beyond the artistic um, spaces. And that's why Studio Kabako, our organization, which was founded 20 years ago um, in Kinshasa first, and now based here in Kisangani in the Northeast Congo, we started looking at Studio Kabako as a space for negotiating our citizenship. And so today, if you come to Kisangani, you'll hear that, okay, Studio Kabako is a place where artists go and make work. But it's also a space where in one particular part of the city where for decades people never had clean drinking water, we started a small pilot project that can provide clean drinking water to a thousand people every day. Is that art? Yes, that's still my art because my art is this act of taking responsibility for my space, my body, my space, my community, and imagining with my community spaces of possibilities. And so we are also working with children educating our children about our forests. And because we believe that we need to prepare tomorrow. I heard, I read somewhere that Confucius said that if your project is for one year, plant rice. If it's for 10 years, plant trees. If it's for 100 years, educate children. Our project is for 100 years, at least. So we'll educate children, we'll plant rice, we'll plant trees, we'll make art because we need these spaces of imagination to re-dream ourselves, to re-imagine who we are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we, um, well, I wanna start by saying, you know, thank you so much for this beautiful and generative talk. Uh, we've been collecting questions in the chat. And at this time we are going to invite audience members to turn on their cameras um, and or ask their questions through audio if they wish. Um, but before that happens, while audience members are gathering their thoughts, um, Fostan and Alyssa, um, do you have any questions for one another at this time? Uh, I don't know if Alyssa has a question. Um, I don't have a question at the, at the moment, um, but I'm gonna, I, I might come back. <laughs> Well, um, I guess we can start um, with a question that's come in from the chat from uh, June. June, are you able to hear us? You can unmute yourself and turn on your video if you like. Just 
question. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I wasn't going to speak. I'm, I'm not going to turn my video on just because um, also tuning in from from Kenya, which and, and so it's a weird hour of the morning as well. But actually, my issue or my question was the notion or the fact that for a long time, artists like you, uh, Faustin, have had to um, uh, ex exhibit your work or, or work basically mostly in the Western world uh, or Europe in order to make a living from your art vis-a-vis -vis being able to do the same within the continent of Africa, uh, so to speak. And I just wanted to hear your view uh, uh, on the on the notion that yeah, for an art, African artist to be able to survive uh, and make a living from their art, basically that has generally been the tradition over time and history. And the fact that my view is that artists like you should pursue um, uh, or attempt to begin to change this narrative especially in this century that we live in. Thank you. Uh, see, when we started Studio Kabako 20 years ago, I think for me, the question was just, how can I tell stories from the Congo? And then, I didn't ask myself the question of whom to. And so I was stuck in a model that existed then and which is still dominant today, even though more and more people on, the, on, the, on this continent are questioning it, which was that to exist as a contemporary art, artist, you have to go to Europe or to the Americas Until I started asking the question uh, myself, like, but who am I talking to? What does it mean for my grandmother, for the people from the Congo? That began a whole new journey for me because it, it meant that suddenly I had to rethink the whole system. Um, We are products of colonialism. And the whole system is that, the whole idea of colonialism is that our continent is only the space for, to extract raw material, but this raw material can only be enjoyed elsewhere. And when I, asked, I started asking myself the question of, uh, of what does it mean for me to develop the work in Africa, but then to essentially make a living from touring this work uh, in the West, it dawned on me that I was no different from the mining company that just took the raw material from here, developed it for the enjoyment of a few overseas. And so we started this journey which is really about making our work relevant to the people, first of all, in our communities, not just through the dollars or the euros that we can bring back, but through the engagement with them here. So maybe it means that we need to rethink our uh, relationship to the, econo the economy of the arts and how are millions of other Congolese doing to survive when they cannot even afford a passport? What can we do to be part uh, of, this really, uh, of, of this society with our tools and make it viable for us here and make it relevant for the people around us? It's a long journey, but one possible answer is in how traditionally the arts functioned in this, um, in this part of the continent. 
because some years ago I traveled to a village and I spent some time with a, a percussionist, you know, a master percussionist. And I asked him if he could earn a living from drums and he said, from drumming, he said, no, that's not a job. I drum because my community needs this, but it can't be my job. It's so like, okay, what does it mean for art to be something that's not a job? Of course, we need to live. How do we reconcile this? I don't have like a definite answer, but this is definitely how I see the future. It doesn't mean that we'll totally cut ourselves from the outside world. Today, it's impossible anyway. Um, but how can we operate thinking really locally? And especially after the COVID uh, crisis, we realize the necessity to be resilient at the most local level and yet remain connected to the uh, you know, wider world. Yeah, I think uh, I'll stop there for that, for this question. Thank you so much. And um, we had a comment that came in on the chat from Donna Jewell. Donna, are you there? Can you turn on your camera and microphone if you're comfortable doing so? Yeah, hi. Hello. Hi. It's the middle of the night there, my goodness. Um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing and um, this profound, um, your, the profoundness of, of your thinking and the integration of, of your, your history, your understanding of, of history and your understanding of your, your individuality and your presence. I just, I just really appreciate that. I, I really appreciate the, what you shared about what is, what is circle. And um, having grown up in the West and engaging as a choreographer, mostly in the proscenium theater my entire life and trying to understand the connection between the performer and the quote viewer um, and the many movements uh, in theater now where that's being questioned and broken down and, and re-examined. I just really appreciated what you shared. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I guess I have another question if there's time. Please go ahead. Yeah. What is what is your next project? What are you working on right now? What's what's involving your your heart and soul and mind right oh. now the most? Is it frozen? It appears to be. Um, Faustin, can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? Can you hear us? Yes. Oh, OK. Uh, Donna, could you ask the question one more time? I think it might have not. Yeah, I didn't hear the question. Okay, thanks. Um, what is what? It, what are you investing in right now for your next project? What is your next creative project, um, and and what prompted prompted this next project? What's important? Uh, right now, I'm busy with a farming project. Okay, so we need to produce food. We need to produce healthy food. Uh, but this is a big project, 30 kilometers from the city of Kisangani, and very degraded forest. And so the dream is to re-enrich 
the soil so that it can be very fertile again. But besides producing food, we're dreaming of planting trees, but not mon monoculture you know, kind of project because you have a lot of tree plantations. But here it is to re rebuild that ecosystem. Uh, it's, it will be on around 700 acres of land to recreate a forest. We hope that in 20, 25 years, there could be a forest there with biodiversity, with uh, the wildlife back in that, which is a way of building a community, really. Because the moment you go there, the question is, who is your neighbor? And how is the neighbor living? What can you do so that the neighbor is part of this movement that you set in? That's really what I'm busy with right now. And I still view it as an artistic project. It's a creative process. Maybe it would be because we want to educate children there, we'll put cameras in their hands so that they learn how to tell stories about that space, about their communities. We'll teach them how to think with their dance because I don't think that I can teach them how to dance. Most of them know how to dance, but how can they think with their dance? Mm. Mm. And reinvent their space with their dance and not just make moves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, it's not, it's not a project that will be immediately seen on stages, but it's an invitation to the wider world to come to the Kisangani region, 30 kilometers from the city by the river Yoko in the forest. Yes. Nice. And, and in the beginning, when you talked about this is a time where we need witches and we need sorcerers. Um, can you share, can you share a little more about that feeling, that idea? It is that as we can all take note of, the world is pretty broken. And I think it would take a miracle to fix this. And so let's call upon all the witches and the magicians, the sorcerers of the past and the future mm. to come together and make this big miracle happen. And when I talk of the sorcerers and magicians, the witches of the past and the future, there is, I think about one very profound word in Lingala, which is one of the major languages in, in, uh, in Congo. It's the word lobi, L-O-B-I. Lobi means yesterday, but it also means tomorrow. And so it's only the context of the sentence that will you know, uh, tell you if they're talking of the past or the future, if they're talking of the ancestors or the un unborn. And I think there was some, there's something very profound in this relationship to time where it's, it ceases to be linear and it becomes this space where our children our, are actually holding our ancestors and vice versa through us, Luby. And so we need 
more and more lobby moments with all the, the sorcerers and magicians that can come together to mend this broken circle of ours. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, we have another question that came in from the chat from Patricia. Patricia, would you be open to unmuting yourself to, to share your thoughts with us? Um, I would be, but gee, I'd like to read what I wrote and I can't find it anymore. <laughs> um, oh. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, well, it's okay. I'll just uh, be spontaneous. I, I missed the first 10 minutes of this event, but first of all, I just want to thank everybody who organized this event. Um, may I call you Faustine? Is that how you pronounce your first name? Over here, that's say Faustin. Faustin. Yeah, um, like in French. To hear you speak is just extraordinary. It brings tears to my eyes. Um, we don't speak that way over here in North America. And not only the language you use and the content and the nature of your work is just uh, truly remarkable. And I think, um, I mean, I've always been terrified of the DRC. Um, I've worked in Africa for many years, part-time and been invited to go actually by healthcare professionals, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it because of you know, what goes on there and the horror stories that I've heard time after time. And the fact that you're doing this arts-based community work in the midst of all of that. I mean, really, uh, all of our students should be here and hearing this incredible courage and strength and innovative spirit that you bring and this passion that you bring to your work. It's uh, really something. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is just um, the fact that you're really expanding our notion of art. You know, I think in much of Western culture, we're, we still have this little tiny slot that we put art into. And this is, you know, this is what it is. And this is where you do it. And this is how it should look. And this is many, many different requirements of the, of the work in order for it to be called art. But basically, you know, what I hear you saying is, you know, we're using this innate creativity that we have and we're cultivating it by actually using it in and interpolating it into all these different aspects of life. Um, and I just really applaud that and uh, want, want to thank you. And, um, Thank you all, you all of you for, for putting this together. And I, I wish that we could uh, give you or show you more support in some way, um, Faustin, if, if it was possible, please let me know how. Thank you. Um, you know, it's true that when you're outside, the stories from the Congo are quite scary. <laughs> and there is a writer from the other Congo, from Congo Brazzaville, called Suni Laboutansi. And Suni wrote, it was like the first line in a novel, something very terrible about our country. He said, I'll say it in French first, then I'll translate. Tout était par terre. Même la terre était par terre. Everything had fallen on the ground. Even the earth had fallen on the ground. When you hear that, you're like, okay, there's nothing here. What's left? Let's go and kill ourselves because there's, there's no hope. But then, some years later, I read something from a Togolese artist called Kosi Efui. And for me, I don't know if he was responding to Tsoni or not. Kosi Efui wrote, Mais les hommes 
été toujours là. But the people were still there. So can say everything had fallen on the ground. Even the, the, the earth itself had collapsed. But the people were still there. And for as long as there are, there are people, if you take the time to be with the people, to listen, there's still so much space for beauty and for imagination. And it's not a given. We have respons to take responsibility for that to happen. And I'm just doing my part. So it's not even a, an act of courage. It is a necessity. I want to live here. And so I want to make it possible for me to live here. I want to make it possible for my children to dream here. So just, you know, it's like saying, yeah, to quote, you know, uh, Borges, I write for me, for a few friends, and to appease the course of time. Simply. I have one question. Um, no, actually, I have a lot of questions. Um, but um, yeah, just thank you. Um, it's just the way you talk about and understand art and how, you know, this insular thinking within the different branches and whatever, how you defeat all of them and bring food into it. It's just like, it makes so much sense. Could we just all do that? So thank you so much. That's why we're so excited to have you. Um, but, you know, when you talk about um, this complicated exchange of being a voice that can create a platform, but within a system, and then this kind of, where in some ways we can't, it's really, I don't know how is it possible to break out of that thought structure that makes what we do understandable like you know how does um compromise or how do you think about compromise i mean you know like how do you negotiate that or do you just like or is that just the deal we have to accept and if we do that then where are the limits within that you know like where does our thinking reach the limit of what is translatable i guess and i mean i think in many ways dance is and arts in general is a way to kind of um move out of that but still to then make it accessible to to everyone as a relational process you're drawn back into this I don't know. I was just wondering what your, like, how you feel about it, or what your thoughts about that are, or if you have any. I wish I had an answer. Then I'd retire. No. I'd have, I'd have yeah. found the formula and I'd, I'd just go and retire. <laughs> but because I don't have an answer, I keep searching. What I I know is that we speak our mother tongues, but we always write in a foreign language. I think it's Jean-Paul Sartre who said that. Yeah. If it's not him, then I can attribute it to him. And I don't think he'll mind. Uh, so if writing is actually speaking in a foreign language could that language be foreign even to the speaker so that because i'm discovering this language 
I'm making an effort to translate it to myself. And by translating it to myself, making it understandable to myself, because really every process is an act of translation. It's like, I have an idea, I go to the studio with my collaborators and I'm trying to translate this idea, this foreign language to make it a friend. And so we keep practicing because yeah, we have to tell the story many times again and again and again and again and again. And eventually it begins to make sense to us. And because we are human beings, we can only hope that it will make sense to other human beings. But it's not propaganda. And that's why I can't expect, uh, expect it to make sense to every human being in the same way. So every person who comes to encounter this work has to also translate it for themselves. So that's the journey, constant translation, but even the artist is translating this work to themselves. Unless you, you, know, you feel so big and you place yourself above the work and you're looking at it from that, okay, that's different. But every project that I pursue, for me, it's like a journey into a territory I don't know. So I'm guided with the question, what is it? How is it like to live in this space? And if it's, it makes sense to me, yeah, I hope it will make to other, it will make sense to, you know, to other human beings out there. Yeah, um, I, have, I have another question just because you were supposed to be the guest professor at UCLA um, this semester and obviously that got canceled um, because of COVID. But what, when you teach a class or when you interact with students um, in various countries in very different contexts and where they come from, what they expect of the education or and like, what do you want them to learn or take away? Or what is it that you feel you can share? I, I guess, yeah, what do you want your students to really take away when they take a class with you? It's about, first of all, for every student to renegotiate their own relationship with themselves. Because I used to, th not to think at some point that not knowing our names was only um, our problem as the former colonized uh, with our broken history. And the more I travel the world, the more I realize that we all in, in this together. So the context may be different, but how many of us really know their names? And so it begins from there. When I work on the body, it was always about opening spaces in the body. So the warm-up class is about releasing, letting go, letting go. Maybe for the sake of a choreography, I can close and go into extreme tension. But when we're preparing the body, it is about opening, opening and more open. Because it's only if we open 
that we, give, we can give ourselves the possibility of reconnecting within our own body first. So this idea of a circle, the idea of circulation of energy unhindered, it begins with my own body. And I, I want to teach that. And once you, you seem to have found some form of um, circle, circulation in your own body, it's important to remember that it's never given once and for all. You need to work at it. It's really like a democracy. It, the moment you start thinking that it's a given, that's when the democracy is in danger. And I teach that notion of responsibility, being taking responsibility for oneself, but not as an isolated being, but as part of a larger world. And how do you negotiate that? Yeah. Of course, I also teach them tricks, you know, about performing and, you know, you know, enhancing your presence, but yeah, those are just tricks. Well, yeah, and those are part of enhancing your presence, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. thank you. You're welcome. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in in the chat. Um, I guess uh, one of the things that I was thinking about while you were talking was the 700 acre forest that you've been dreaming about. And I was also thinking about how you were talking about webs of relations that come from the act of naming. And I was wondering if there was some sort of a, a name that had been bubbling up for y'all with the uh, the story of this forest or what it could possibly be called or something like that, or maybe that's too far in the future. No, it's, it's got a, it's, it's got a name or names already because there are rivers running through it. And so the biggest one is called Yoko, Y-O-K-O. But there are two smaller ones, like Lusongo. So for me, it will be those names from the rivers, because you have the movement and you have the coolness of the water. And without, the, without water, yeah. No forest can can survive. So I don't need to to be creative about a name here. I'll just take what's there already. I have one question. Um, yes, Alisa. Now. <laughs> um, I guess just hearing you talk um, about uh, like asking your big questions or uh, the opening um, of, of your body and the other others' bodies um, and taking responsibility to form uh, greater connections, all of that. I'm uh, my curiosity is like what what happens when you're faced with resistance or like are you faced with resistance? Are there collaborators or artists or students that you work with um, and and how do you how do you go about that you know the moment you don't take that circle for a given you're more accepting of those situations of resistance as part of the journey. And ultimately, 
It's about listening and inviting those uh, sharing the, the space with me to listen. And when we start listening, even if we disagree, we find a way of still building together. So I don't really have a formula. You can't, you cannot, you cannot, because it's not a given. And I said earlier that I want the work to be as much people specific as possible. So it means that I have to be open to different perspectives, different ways of relation, uh, uh, relating to, to life and to others. And because I want to listen to all these different ways and take them and make something with, with, with them rather than fighting them. Thank you so much um, for joining us this evening. Um, Postan, Alyssa, thank you both so much for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. Um, it seems that we are drawing to the close of our evening. Um, and uh, if everyone can go to uh, Studio Kabako, which is K-A-B-A-K-O.org to learn more about um, Fostan's and um, his colleagues' work. And then Lara. Sorry for the lapse. Um, yeah. Well, thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. Um, thank you, Faustine. Thank you, um, Alisa. It was it was fantastic. Thank you so much. I don't know what else to say. Uh, we all like just no. I mean, I think um, I wish we could have more conversations like that. Um, so thank you and to be continued i hope um yes yes so so i can contact you i have so many questions left i'm sorry <laughs> but, um no um i just also wanted to quickly announce our next um event um at john summers it will take place on march the 18th at the same time and we will be joined by the percussionist composer and filmmaker sarah hennies and Carola Obermüller uh, with the University of New Mexico um, um, of, and an associate professor of theory and composition. So until then, thank you and we wish you a nice evening.